Deborah, you can begin. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's field hearing on nursing home debt collection practices. My name is Deborah Royster, and I'm the Assistant Director of the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. The CFPB is a 21st century agency that implements and enforces federal consumer financial law and ensures that markets for consumer financial products are fair, transparent, and competitive. We are very grateful to those of you joining us here today, including public officials, community leaders, advocates, industry representatives, and of course, consumers. We thank you for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us for this discussion about this very important issue. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you what you can expect at today's field hearing. We'll kick off the event with CFPB Director Rohit Chopra providing remarks and then move into a discussion moderated by Director Chopra with advocates and experts who are working to address the complex set of challenges surrounding nursing home debt collection. Finally, following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity for some audience members who signed up earlier to make a public comment and share their experiences with us. Today's event is being live, scre live streamed and recorded at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. And now I would like to welcome Director Chopra. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you all for joining today's virtual hearing. The pandemic had a devastating impact on residents of nursing homes. Older adults across the country experience further isolation from their families and friends, and mortality from COVID-19 has been disproportionately borne by those living in long-term care facilities. Recently, there has been greater attention to the investors and large firms operating nursing homes and other skilled nursing facilities and whether quality of care has suffered. But there's been less attention to some of the financial impacts on nursing home residents and their families in the aftermath of the pandemic. Congress established the Office of Financial Protection for Older Americans within the CFPB to focus on financial issues related to long-term care, to combat financial exploitation of older adults, and to spot emerging consumer protection risks. By law, the office is required to coordinate consumer protection efforts across federal and state agencies on issues facing older adults. And we will be increasing our focus on this work. I expect that our dedicated office on older Americans will emerge as a key pillar within the policymaking and law enforcement community on financial issues faced by older adults and their caregivers. Given the growing population of older adults, changes in technology, the retirement security gap, the cost of long-term care, and so much more, there is no shortage of challenges to tackle. As part of this work today, the CFPB and its dedicated office on older Americans are pleased to host this hearing to focus on one particular issue, medical debt collection practices in connection with nursing home care. In conjunction with today's hearing, the CFPB's Office of Financial Protection for Older Americans conducted an analysis of nursing home debt collection issues. The analysis included a review of enrollment contracts, public filings, and consumer complaints. In a newly published report, the CFPB details some of the unique circumstances relevant to medical debts associated with nursing home care. And specifically, we have found that family and friends of a nursing home resident are sometimes pursued for debt collection even though federal law prohibits nursing homes participating in certain federal insurance programs from requiring third parties to be financially responsible. This creates a risk that caregivers and others are subjected to debt collection and credit reporting practices on invalid debt. As an initial step, 
the CFPB, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are alerting nursing facilities and debt collectors about this potential risk. The CFPB has also issued guidance to the enforcement community that explains when certain practices can violate the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Over the years, I have heard from those in both the debt collection industry and the nursing home industry that law-abiding actors that treat patients or consumers with respect and dig dignity are routinely disadvantaged by having to compete with those who engage in exploitative tactics or otherwise break the law. Debt collection firms are a key part of the consumer finance ecosystem, and nursing homes are a major sector within our healthcare industry. It is up to all of us to make sure that we protect patients, their caregivers, and those honest businesses who are serving them well. To aid in these efforts, we're urging families to file complaints with us and other federal and state agencies related to this issue. We also ask that those in the nursing home and debt collection industries who are aware of wrongdoing by a competitor firm to confidentially inform law enforcement. We're grateful for the ongoing partnership with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to address the range of harms associated with medical debt. I really want to thank everyone again for joining today's hearing, as well as to all of those involved with organizing it. We will begin with a panel of experts on the emerging issues facing older adults, nursing home care, and more. And as Deborah mentioned, after our panel, we'll be accepting testimony from members of the public who signed up in advance of today's event. I'm very eager to hear from all of today's participants. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to you, Deborah. Thank you, Director Chopra, for your remarks. We will now transition to our panel discussion, which will be moderated by Director Chopra. At this time, I would like to invite the panelists to turn on their video. While they're doing so, I will briefly introduce them. Our first panelist is Rita Chula. Rita is the Director of Caregiving with the AARP Public Policy Institute. She manages and provides content expertise on internal and external family caregiving initiatives with a specific focus on identifying and supporting the needs of multicultural family caregivers. Next, we have Carol Silver Elliott. Carol is president and CEO of the Jewish Home Family, which provides skilled nursing, assisted living, and at home and community services for older adults in New Jersey and in New York. Our next panelist is Eric Carlson, attorney a directing attorney at Justice in Aging. Eric has broad experience in long-term services and supports, including home and community-based services, nursing facility care, and assisted living facilities. He is currently engaged in consumer advocacy efforts on Medicaid managed long-term supports and services in Florida and in New Jersey. Next, we have Emma Katerine from the law office of Ahmad Keshervaz. Recently, the firm has been focusing on, fa on Fair Debt Collection Practices Act claims against debt collection firms that are systematically filing baseless fraudulent conveyance suits against the families of nursing home residents. Next, I'd like to introduce Anna Anderson from the National Consumer Law Center. Prior to joining NCLC, Anna was a supervising attorney at Legal Assistance of Western New York where she founded and oversaw the Consumer Protection Unit, helping to eliminate more than $1 million in debt for low-income New Yorkers. Anna is also the co-founder and chair of the National Coalition of Nursing Home Debt Advocates. Our next panelist is Sam Brooks, Director of Public Policy for the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. Sam worked on nursing home debt collection issues as a lawyer for community legal services in Philadelphia where he became an expert on nursing homes and nursing home regulations in Pennsylvania. And finally, we'd like to welcome Miriam Sheline, Managing Attorney for ProSeniors, Inc. 
Miriam oversees Pro Seniors Legal Program, including a legal helpline and a team of staff attorneys who advocate for older adults in Ohio in civil legal matters. Thank you for uh, to all of our panelists for joining today's discussion. I'll now invite each of you to provide brief opening remarks. Rita, let's start with you. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Director Chopra and Ms. Royster, thank you for inviting AARP to serve as a panelist today. On behalf of our 38 million members and all older Americans nationwide, AARP appreciates the opportunity to participate in today's field hearing. I will discuss the financial challenges family caregivers face in assisting their family and friends to help provide a greater understanding of their situations when they experience nursing home debt collection. We also applaud the actions that CFPB and CMS have taken today to address these issues. There are over 48 million family caregivers who assist individuals with everything from eating, bathing, and dressing to medical nursing tasks, such as wound care and managing heavy medication regimens and providing rides to appointments. They also coordinate care across providers and places of care, advocate for their loved ones, manage finances, and pay for caregiving expenses out of pocket. Family caregivers provide about $470 billion annually in unpaid care to their loved ones. In assisting their family and friends, they can take on physical, emotional, and financial challenges and may neglect their own needs. About four in 10 family caregivers are from communities of color. More than 78% are incurring out-of-pocket costs as a result of caregiving. Caregivers spend on average $7,242 annually on out-of-pocket caregiving expenses, or 26% of their income. African-American Black and Hispanic Latino caregivers spend 34% and 47% respectively on average for caregiving expenses annually. This highlights the financial strain they experience. Hispanic Latino and Asian American Pacific Islander females experience much higher financial strain than their male caregiver peers. About half of family caregivers report experiencing at least one financial setback due to caregiving such as dipping into personal savings, reducing how much they are able to save for their own retirement, dipping into existing retirement savings, and cutting back on their own health care spending. Caregivers providing more hours of care per week also have higher out-of-pocket costs. 41% of caregivers say they are spending more money on caregiving as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Caregivers may even cut back on hours or quit their jobs due to caregiving. So family caregivers may already be dealing with these financial challenges when they are hit with nursing home debt collection on top of everything else. It is critical that family caregivers are informed about the protections they have against nursing home debt collection under federal law. I look forward to the discussion and thank you again for the opportunity to join today. Thank you very much, Rita. Carol, would you like to go next? Thank you, Deborah, and thank you for allowing me to have a moment in this hearing as well. I think this is an important topic and Rita, your comments certainly bring a lot of this home. The demographics, don't lie. We have a growing number of older adults in this country and we have a growing number of people with tremendous needs that our system is certainly not entirely capable of meeting. I know that for the last 10 years alone, we cared for my aging mother-in-law and the expenses, the drain, as well as the emotional toll were not insignificant. I'm here today both as a provider of 
in a nonprofit mission based values driven organization, but also as the immediate past chair of leading age, the national association that represents nonprofit providers, more than 5000 of them around the country. I believe and I believe that most of my colleagues are committed to the fact that we exist for one reason and one reason only, and that is to care for the most vulnerable, to care for the people who need our care. No one makes a decision that, oh gee, it'd be fun to live in, live in a nursing home, although I will tell you we have a lot of fun every day, but that's not why people come to a nursing home. They come to a nursing home because they need care and they need assistance, and that's what we live to do. We have to support our organization. We have to be able to pay our staff. We struggle to compete for staff every single day. We struggle with the fact that 48% of our volume in our nursing home as of today is 48% Medicaid and that every single Medicaid day that we provide care, we are losing $200 a day over what, not what we charge, but what it costs us to provide that care. It is a challenge. That being said, there is absolutely no reason that there should be unscrupulous or deceptive practices in the way we bill or the way we collect. As this discussion came about, I looked over our admission agreements that are extremely clear and are reviewed with our admissions team. The fact that a member of our finance team is always present to review the admissions agreement, not just with the elder who's being admitted, but also with the family and the financial power of attorney. At every care conference, we review the financial obligations. We make sure that people understand there is absolutely no reason for people to be suing someone that is disconnected from this care. And quite frankly, I think it's appalling and outrageous. But I think we have to remember that there are 15,000 nursing homes in this country and they're all different. Each of us approaches their work in a different way. Most of us are ethical providers. You know, my response to increasing oversight and increasing regulations is bring it on because we have nothing to hide, but not everyone is in that situation. You know, we talked a little bit, the director referenced the COVID era. We lived through two of the toughest years that any of us can ever imagine. I had staff who were ill. I had family members who were dying. I had people who worked hours that were beyond belief. We were all working seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I said the biggest learning I had at the beginning of COVID was how long I could go without any sleep at all because they care about the people that we care for. They care about making sure that people are served, that their families are served, that we are connecting in every way we can and we're doing it ethically and we're doing it in a way that shows our care, commitment and compassion. I appreciate the opportunity to speak a little bit about what we do as a long-term care provider, but also what our industry does. Not everyone, not every industry has all good providers, right? Not every industry has all good people. There are bad actors everywhere, but I want to believe that the majority of us are doing it right, doing it for the right reasons and doing it because we care. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your comments, Carol. Eric, would you like to go next? Thank you. The relevant law here has been effective since October of 1990, and the law currently prohibits nursing facilities from requiring or, or, or um, accepting the agreement of a family member of a friend to become financially liable. So in short, family members and friends shouldn't be liable, but for that entire 30 year plus period, nursing facilities have been breaking the law by suing family members and friends for the alleged debts of nursing facility residents. I've been working in this area for almost that entire period. It has been going on each and every year since that point. The basic problem is this, many nursing facilities break the law as an ongoing business practice. It's what they do, it's in the admission agreement, it's, these are their procedures. They get away with it for four principal reasons. First, Residents and their families are unfamiliar with the law. They, they don't understand, so they don't necessarily know when the facility is doing something illegal. 
Second, residents and families are hesitant to challenge the facility, both because they don't understand the law to start with, and also because they're scared of getting into disputes with the staff and the facility that's caring for the resident. Third, the government inspection agencies rarely cite violations of the relevant regulation, and when they do, are unlikely to assess a monetary penalty. And then finally, fourth, relatively few private lawyers file affirmative cases against nursing facilities for these illegal practices. These four reasons suggest what needs to be done. The inspection agencies should review facility admission agreements and assess meaningful penalties when the agreements contain illegal provisions. This is under the control of the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, along with state health departments. Private consumer law attorneys should file more affirmative cases against nursing facilities for illegal practices. On this panel, Ms. Katerin will discuss some strategies. And then regarding consumers and their unfamiliar, unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with the law, I'll recommend our own guide, 25 Common Nursing Home Problems and How to Resolve Them, available for free on the Justice and Aging website. This guide gives step-by-step instructions for recognizing the false claims, the false statements that nursing facilities will make, and then um, guiding people on how they can push back against those false and, and improper claims. This event today can be an important starting point for advocacy for residents and their families and friends. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much for your remarks, Eric. Emma, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, thank you to the Bureau uh, for having this event. I'm a proud uh, alumni of the uh, CFPB myself, so I'm very happy to be here. And I would also like to express uh, gratitude um, to the late Alfonso Franklin. He was uh, our first plaintiff for lawsuits about this issue, um, and he passed away earlier this year. He was a very brave man to stand up for uh, what was right and what was happening to him, and I miss him dearly. Uh, more than 30 years ago, Congress passed the Nursing Home Reform Act, which established a number of important rights for residents of nursing homes and their families, including a prohibition on nursing homes requiring financial guarantees of third parties as a condition of admission. In more recent years, the federal government has heeded concerns of facilities attempting to evade this prohibition by enacting additional regulations. But my firm has witnessed nursing homes and debt collectors uh, finding new ways to evade this public policy that protects the elderly and their families. Unable to hold third parties, usually family members, liable for nursing home debts via admission agreements because of the federal law, defendant, uh, the nursing homes and debt collectors fabricate claims of fraudulent conveyance, which allows them to bring third parties into their debt collection lawsuits and to demand attorney's fees from them on top of the nursing home debt. Similarly, we have also seen nursing homes and debt collectors fabricate claims under the doctrine of necessaries, which allows them to bring third party spouses into their debt collection lawsuits. Nursing home residents tend to be judgment proof, making debt collection against them difficult or practically impossible. Obtaining liability against family members or third parties can provide access to bank accounts to be frozen and wages to be garnished. By deceptively and unfairly fabricating claims of fraudulent conveyance, nursing homes and their debt collectors can turn a negligible return into a full recovery with attorney's fees paid for by the other side. Therefore, the uh, debt collection law firms and nursing homes we have witnessed have engaged in a widespread and systematic deceptive debt collection scheme to squeeze money out of hundreds of consumers who do not owe it. And uh, we have two federal lawsuits pending about this issue, and we are excited to see the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau taking interest in the issue as well. There are hundreds of consumers who are affected, far more than uh, any private firm like us could help to uh, hope to help out. Um, and we really need the federal government to take action here. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for your comments, Emma. Anna, would you like to go next? 
Yes, thank you so much. I'm very grateful to be here today. Um, I've worked on this issue for years and to uh, finally have um, the Bureau taking such great action on this devastating issue is um, really rewarding. And I will just say uh, to start off that you will actually hear today from two of my former clients who I think will be best able to tell you just how devastating these lawsuits can be. What I really want to say is that you know, when I first started taking these cases as a consumer debt defense attorney, I was shocked that lawsuits were being brought against people who did not actually owe the debt. And when I began digging into these cases, I found hundreds of lawsuits in my county in upstate New York alone brought against family members and friends for a nursing home residence bill. And that was just uh, really jaw dropping for me to realize that this was a practice that was not only routine, uh, but it was causing financial ruin for hundreds of family members in my community alone. Forcing family members and friends of a nursing home resident to pay the nursing home resident's bill is not only extremely unfair, but it's also illegal under federal law. Nursing homes use loopholes in the law to get around this prohibition, and we are seeing a growing number of lawsuits against residents, families, and friends, resulting in judgments of tens of thousands of dollars. The threat of these lawsuits puts families in the position of having to choose between helping their loved ones get the care they desperately need and protecting themselves from financial ruin. This is a choice that no one should ever have to be forced to make. I get calls all the time from people who are served with these lawsuits who had no idea that this was even a remote possibility. They believe that not only that they're going to lose their own income and assets, but they're also concerned that their loved ones who are still in their nursing home may be potentially kicked out if they don't pay up. When I've spoken to the lawyers who represent the nursing homes in these cases and have asked them, you know, why they are collecting against these third parties, you know, they tell me that they know that they'll never be able to collect from the residents themselves and they have to find some way to get paid. That is just against all interests of justice that I can think of even remotely. And it's deeply troubling practice that, again, we are only seeing increasing, especially with the cost of nursing home care going up. Um, I'm very grateful that the CFPB is looking into the issue and hoping that more investigations and enforcement actions will be taken against the nursing homes and the debt collectors for these unlawful practices. Um, I'm very grateful as well to my clients who will be speaking today to give you a more understanding of how these lawsuits truly impact the families and caregivers. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Anna, for your comments. Sam, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you, Deborah, and uh, thank you, Director Coker, for holding this uh, really important hearing. Um, the nursing home admissions process can be unclear and fraught with anxiety both for potential residents and for their family member. A family member's primary concern is that their loved one received high quality care in a safe and healthy environment. Um, primarily being focused on those priorities, family members are often presented with pages long admission packets uh, that require attention to detail and signatures. Um, while some of these documents may be, may be routine, excuse me, um, some nursing homes, as we heard today, um, uh, include additional documents that can lead to significant uh, repercussions for family members down the road. Despite their prohibition, again, as we heard, some nursing homes do include, they'll, it'll be wedged inside these admission packets, a, a third party liability contract or a financial responsibility contract. Um, these contracts ask a family member to assume financial responsibility for unpaid balances um, should they accrue during the resident's stay. Despite these, um, this prohibition, uh, 
these uh, nursing homes continue, excuse me, to, to use these contracts. Um, sometimes they refer to them as re responsible parties, but are not clear what responsibility means and that it means you're guaranteeing payment for a resident stay. Uh, family members will often be assured by the intake workers or the admission workers that it will, that the visit will be paid either by insurance, by Medicare, by Medicaid, or by the resident. And it's the financial responsibility contract is just simply a formality. Uh, facilities will sometimes capitalize on a family member's concern that their loved one receive necessary care as soon as possible um, and that they may not understand exactly what they're signing. Um, unfortunately, this is a common practice in the admissions process where their uh, residents and family members are sometimes asked to sign uh, pre-dispute arbitration contracts, which although legal, un unlike these, are never to the, to the resident's benefit. Um, after these contracts are signed, um, family members more often than not forget about them. They don't think about them until the faci facilities start sending them bills and asking them to pay for the resident stay. Um, often surprised to receive these bills, then the facility will, reply, will provide the contract. Um, oftentimes these bills are, um, these outstanding bills are the result of, are inaccurate or result of improper billing practices uh, by the nursing home itself, failing to bill Medicaid, failing to properly bill an insurer um, and having balances and nevertheless asking a resident or the family member to pay it. Family members will be told they have to pay these balance so that the resident may stay in a facility or if the resident is no longer in the facility or the resident has passed to avoid the bill being sent to collections. And unfortunately, despite the illegality of these contracts, some family members just pay them because they are afraid. They don't want their loved ones to be paid, um, excuse me, to be evicted from a nursing home. They don't want the headache of being sued or being called um, incessantly by collection um, debt uh, uh, collectors, excuse me. So this, we as advocates for residents um, and family members, we've heard about this for years. This is an important first step. Awareness is um, really so key to this that family members know that these contracts are illegal. When family members or residents, if they're presented with these contracts, should refuse to sign the contract and should carry with them a citation to the um, Code of Federal Reg Regulations, 42 CFR 483.15A3, excuse me, uh, that prohibit their use. You can also contact your local long-term care ombudsman program. Ombudsmen are advocates who work on behalf of residents. Um, and you can let them know that the facility is asking uh, a resident or excuse me, asking a family member or another loved one to sign uh, an illegal contract. Contact your local state survey agency or file a complaint with CFPB. Um, and never sign, ever sign one of these contracts unless you have spoken to an attorney first. Um, uh, you can go to our website, theconsumervoice.org, to read more about these um, uh, issues of uh, uh, the guarantee contracts at the beginning of, at the admissions process and also other stuff that can confront consumers, family members, and residents during the admissions process to nursing homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, for your comments. And Miriam, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, thank you both to Director Chopra and the CFPB for inviting uh, me to participate on this panel today. Um, I wanna give you a little perspective um, of what we've seen on the ground here in Ohio. Uh, Pro Seniors is a nonprofit organization that assists Ohio seniors with their legal and long-term care needs. Uh, on the legal side, we provide a legal free advice helpline um, giving Ohio seniors uh, advice on any issue. Uh, we've served over 7,000 per year in that capacity. Our number one and number two issues are institutional or nursing home Medicaid and debt collection. On the in-house staff side, uh, we represent seniors in Southwest Ohio on public benefits, primarily institutional Medicaid and consumer issues. Over the years, we've seen these two issues intersect uh, increasingly when community spouses, widows and widowers, and elderly children have been sued 
for nursing home debt. Um, where these issues have involved deceptive claims, in addition to defense, we have brought affirmative actions under the federal consumer protection laws, such as the FDCPA and uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, as well as advocating to incorporate the Nursing Home Reform Act into Ohio's consumer statutes. In these cases, we have seen individuals sued for tens of thousands of dollars, including demands for 18% interest, attorney's fees, and even punitive damages because they were required by the facility to sign contracts as sponsors or responsible party. We've also seen attorneys in fact under powers of attorney sued based merely on allegations of misuse of funds because there was a debt owed. We've seen spouses and, and surviving spouses sued under Ohio's necessaries or support statute. And we've even seen family members sued on claims that they orally promised to pay the nursing home. As already indicated, these suits to family members are absolutely devastating, both emotionally and financially. From the moment family member has to face the need to admit their loved one to a facility, they are burdened with demands to sign stacks of documents. They are forced to navigate the unknown quagmires of institutional Medicaid process, culminating in them being sued for a debt that could literally bankrupt them. Thank you again for my particip for allowing me to participate and show our perspective of what we're seeing here in Ohio. Thank you, Miriam, for your remarks. And to all of the panelists, I would like to express my gratitude for all of the work that you do in your communities each and every day. I will now turn the program over to D Director Chopra to kick off today's discussion. Director Chopra. Well, thank you, Deborah, and thanks to everybody. I think part of what we're trying to accomplish today is also to share um, some expertise more specifically about how does the nursing, nursing home enrollment process work. One of the things we do at the CFPB is, while well, most of our work is about credit, we seek to understand how is someone signing up to go to college or to buy a home or to buy a car. And many people may actually not be familiar with how actually many Americans finance their admission into a nursing home, how they pay for it on an ongoing basis, and how some of those practices work. So I wonder if I could start with you, Carol, to give an overview um, of how things have changed, what is a typical experience um, and how does it intersect with Medicare and Medicaid? Thank you. Uh, that's a it's a complicated question. So we, you know, we're really talking about two types of admissions here, and I think it's important to understand that we're talking about a subacute admission, someone who's coming in for therapy, who's primarily Medicare or managed care, and we are talking about folks who are coming in for long term care. So most of the folks who come in for short-term rehabilitation have either Medicare and a secondary or a managed care product. And at this point, our length of stay is about 21 days. The one place that we do face consumer expense is in that copay for Medicare that sometimes takes, not sometimes, often takes people by surprise. Generally speaking, um, it does not become a huge issue for folks, but because particularly the length of stay is short, there is always a concern about Medicare in that regardless of how many times all of us educate people about the fact that 100 days does not mean every time you're in for rehab, you get 100 days, people will still tell us on a daily basis, but why are you sending me home? I have 100 days. And you know there is some confusion around that. On the long-term care setting, we really have two models in our organization for people to enter. One is certainly private pay and the other is under Medicaid. Um, you know, private pay uh, frequently is a short-term arrangement. People do run out of assets. Um, I think 
you know, would they outlive their funds? And we're grateful for the fact that they're living longer. But we do facilitate the conversion to Medicaid and make sure that no one's care is disrupted. And we do the same thing in our assisted living setting. We promise that when you are depleted in funds, we will find a home for you and you will not leave the organization. Uh, private pay, it is not an inexpensive proposition. But when someone comes in under private pay, it is with the understanding that it is their funds that will be used. And at no time do we ask the family. Uh, the financial power of attorney who has access, and that's clearly spelled out to the resident's resources, um, is expected to, to pay the bills with the resident's resources until such time that there are not resources available. But at least where we are, it's a very straightforward process. Rita, can I ask you to add on to this? Because I think many people may not be familiar. What is the resident's responsibility once they've converted or are a Medicaid eligible um, patient? What, what is typically their financial responsibility once they qualify for Medicaid? Uh, respectfully, this is not necessarily my area of expertise. So oh, I I'm so sorry. To the panelists on that. Carol, I can turn it back to you then. I apologize. So the patient's responsibility when we're talking about Medicare is generally a percentage. Um, you know, it's, I can't think of the number off the top of my head, but it's, I think it's $196 a day if I'm, if I'm stating, and if I'm stating that incorrectly, I apologize. But that is something that has to that is clear with people when they come in the door that there's going to be a patient responsibility after a certain number of days. Um, it's a full coverage for the first days, and then it switches to a place where there is a co-payment that is required for folks. We make that clear at the outset. We make that clear at the care conference when they convert. I will also tell you it's an interesting phenomenon that we're seeing right now, and maybe it's a commentary on the state of care in, in the world, or at least in the United States, that there's a lot of pressure for us to discharge people quickly. And I know the hospitals see that as well. We get a lot of push from managed care, and we get a lot of push from um, hospitals about discharging. And what has been happening on a on a fairly frequent basis that we haven't seen before is that families are either appealing and winning, which we support, or that people are saying, my loved one isn't ready to go home. They wanna pay privately for a period of time until they feel ready. We do that both in our long-term care setting and we have also set up what we call a rehab hotel in our assisted living so that people have a lower fee to pay while still having access to therapy. But you know, it, it uncovers, I think, another problem, which is this pressure. It's a financial pressure. It's a it's an industry pressure to move people out of care settings, both in long term care as in subacute care, I should say, as well as in hospitals. Sometimes before they feel that they're ready. And maybe I'll open it up to the rest of the panel of what are the typical billing and collection practices um, within the nursing home industry? Is it typically ones where uh, the resident themselves are dealing with payment? Is it typically a, a family member or caregiver who has access to that individual's funds or supporting them themselves? Any comments about typical experiences on billing and payment? I can say that both those happen, of course. There's the resident. The resident is the person who should be responsible. And, and that, I think, is the, the really bedrock message of today. The resident is in the nursing facility. If, everyone's, if anyone's responsible, it needs to be the resident. If the system works correctly, when someone runs out of money, Medicaid will step in. And in response to your previous question, even under Medicaid, the person has an unmarried person has the obligation to pay virtually all of his or her monthly income towards a share of cost or patient pay amount to the nursing facility. 
the personal needs allowance varies from the state to state, but is only 40, 50, $70 a month. Uh, everything else goes to the nursing facility for, for an unmarried individual. But you know, the, what's relevant here today are these cases brought not against the family member, but against, but excuse me, not against the resident, but about somebody else who didn't stay in the nursing facility. And those are the claims that from the perspective of, I think the law and many of the people on this panel are inappropriate because the federal law prohibits the facility from obligating the uh, family member as part of the admission agreement. And in response to that, many facilities these days try to skate around it in some of the various strategies mentioned during these initial panel discussions. I think most prominently through the argument that the quote unquote responsible party, if the, if the resident hasn't paid, that must mean that the responsible party didn't handle the resident's money correctly or um, supposedly didn't handle the resident's um, Medicaid correctly. And because of that, the family member who is just trying to help out, right? Who's just, who's just assisting the resident is faced with a lawsuit for the entirety of what the resident owes, which may be tens of thousands of dollars. And, and can I ask others to weigh in on the extent to which, and maybe Carol, I might ask you too, if the typical ways within the industry that bills are transmitted um, and the communication around what the patient, the resident's responsibility versus someone else. Are there diversities of, of how those bills are crafted, communicated? Where have you found that there can be sometimes resident or family confusion? I, I'm certain that there's diversity in the way bills are communicated. Um, in response to the comment that was just made, and again, I can only speak for the way that we as an organization handle things, there would never be a tens of thousands of dollars surprise at any point for anyone because billing is done on an ongoing basis and conversations are held on an ongoing basis. But the reality of the way that the billing is done is that it is directed to the resident or the resident's representative who is responsible for resources. And that's the way that the language is worded. We would never be sending a bill to someone who had no relationship or had not provided any um, documentation that they had access to the individual's resources. And we all know that that financial power of attorney is null and void when a person passes away. So at that point, either if there's an if there's a um, an unpaid bill, it would go to towards the estate if there is an estate, or it really becomes an uncollectible bill. And we do have significant bad debt on an ongoing basis. That's part of the nature of the beast. Um, bills are done on a monthly basis. We and our finance team review those bills on an ongoing basis. So if there's something that's happening where we see thousands and thousands of dollars, not that I can imagine that happening, um, surfacing, it's something that would be addressed far earlier and should be addressed far earlier. And they, there shouldn't be, A, there shouldn't be any big surprise at the end, and B, there shouldn't be any big surprise for someone who's not um, intimately involved with this. The only time you might see this is with a spouse who who has a different kind of obligation. But, you know, as a financial power of attorney that has access to resources, that obligation disappears when the elder passes away. It is, as you just said, it is the resident's obligation. And I, well, are there unscrupulous providers? Are there people who are merchandising this? Yeah, I'm sure there are. Are there, are there unfortunately some unscrupulous attorneys out there that are working to hide assets so that people qualify for Medicaid? We know that's true too. There's all kinds of games being played, but I will tell you that the ethical providers are working in a way that is transparent and above board. And maybe I can ask the rest of the panel, um, for those who have worked directly with um, residents or their caregivers or their families who've been subject to, you know, some of the questionable collection efforts, 
you know, many debt collection firms that work on medical debt go through quite a bit of a process to make sure they're determining is the debt valid? Are they contacting the right person? Are there trends you are seeing in terms of types of firms or um, common patterns of those who are initiating, whether they're collection as, uh, actions or lawsuits in this context? Maybe I can start um, with Anna or with Anna or with Emma. Yes, so um, I really appreciate Carol's comments. What I will say is from our perspective is none of that happens. And in fact, the direct opposite happens in terms of the billing and in terms of communication with the resident or the resident family members or loved ones who are helping them with their um, nursing home bills. So we do get calls from people who have never once heard from the nursing home that a bill is owed and in fact are only sued after the resident has died or uh, after tens of thousands of dollars in bills have accrued. Um, my experience is that the law firms investigating these claims and bringing these lawsuits are not doing very much work to validate these claims before bringing the lawsuits. The lawsuits are often boilerplate complaints that are copied and pasted over and over again so that the only thing that's different from one person's lawsuit to the next is the name of the resident and the facility that the bill was initially owed to. Um, this means that um, family members have the burden of going into court and saying, this is not my debt, I have no idea why I'm being sued for this despite the fact that the lawyers haven't done the initial work to actually prove and validate these debts to begin with. And I can turn it over to Emma um, if she wants to give more feedback on the lawsuit she's seeing. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people uh, think that upstate New York and New York City don't have much in common, but unfortunately this is one area in which they do have a lot in common. That's certainly been uh, our experience as well, everything uh, that Anna said. And uh, in terms of what type of firms, the interesting thing um, with our experience has been that these are often well-respected elder law firms. Um, and our litigation is still in early stages, so we don't uh, have a lot of understanding yet as to exactly why this is happening or when it started, um, these sort of deceptive collection practices. But what I can tell you is we have hundreds of complaints making fraudulent conveyance claims with no evidence of any transfers of assets, any transfers of money. The uh, co debt collectors in the nursing homes have never proffered that kind of evidence before. Um, you know, we have cases where uh, with uh, the client I mentioned, the late Alfonso Franklin, uh, they continue to serve uh, the lawsuit on his deceased mother, even though she had passed away. Uh, and even after he told them that she had passed away. Um, so this is the kind of uh, uh, attention to detail uh, these firms are paying, which is to say none at all. They just recycle these complaints. We even saw complaints that were so clearly boilerplate, they would make obviously false allegations like saying that a mother and daughter were married and thus the doctrine of necessary is applied. Um, it's really uh, shameful practices and unfortunately they get away with it because these consumers who are being uh, sued are almost always pro se. Um, because these lawsuits are for such high uh, monetary values in New York, they go to our New York Supreme Courts, and uh, it's much more difficult to obtain free legal help in the New York Supreme Courts. And so these consumers are often facing these large lawsuits alone. And I know with Mr. Franklin in particular, he was very disturbed that he was being accused of fraud. He thought, oh, I might be facing criminal charges. Uh, a pro se consumer, when they see fraud on a lawsuit, they might think that they are possibly facing something criminal when he had done nothing. 
uh, nothing wrong whatsoever. All he had done was love his mother and try to get the best care for her that he could. I would like to Miriam, add if, go ahead, Miriam. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so in Ohio, uh, you know, our perspective, we've been seeing these probably 15 years, uh, obviously on the increase. Um, what we have seen is that that the facilities will, um, you know, really pursue a family member, any family member to sign the admission agreement. Uh, those admission agreements as responsible party includes provisions like you will cooperate in the Medicaid process and with regard to you have access to resources, you're saying in this contract that you are warranting that you do, even when the facility knows this isn't correct. So in one case, for instance, the uh, resident's daughter had power of attorney. Um, he was already admitted to the facility. They pursued his elderly spouse um, who had suffered from a stroke, but was still in the community to have her sign this resident agreement. Um, and even though he was on Medicaid, there's a glitch in Medicaid at some point, uh, it stops, there's a bill, they sued the spouse after he died. They sued the daughter as the power of attorney. Um, they sued another daughter, um, as Emma was indicating, for fraudulent conveyance. Or, um, generally speaking, they sue on the basis that on the contract, we're not saying you guarantee the debt, but you made promises under the contract, uh, which you breached by not, quote, cooperating in Medicaid. Um, which may generally is not true, um, or that you misused funds. Um, so you may have access to, you know, a $1,500 bank account and the debt is $20,000. They're going to say, well, you misused the funds and they will sue you. Um, this is, as I said, been going on for 10, 15 years. It's been increased over time. Um, so yet yeah, there's no question in mind, it's usually uh, because there is a problem with the Medicaid process um, and may not be a fault of the family members, uh, but the family members are getting a bill and they're told, well, Medicaid's, in, we're working on Medicaid. We're working on Medicaid. Don't worry about the bill. We're working on Medicaid. Medicaid doesn't go through. They get sued for $100,000. This, Miriam, I would say yeah. is something in, across medical debt issues so many individuals report to us that you know they, they thought that the it was going through the insurance process back and forth and i know providers also deal with the bureaucracy of the insurance going back and forth and it feels like people are in a doom loop um and and maybe i could just transition a little more big picture beyond the individual issue that was just discussed Maybe I'll turn it to Rita and Sam a bit about what are some of the broader financial challenges that caregivers are facing or family members are facing? And what are some of the places in which they can go to help, get help if they're dealing with challenges um, in the process, um, especially when it comes to these financial issues? Well, I can start by talking about some of the issues that family caregivers are facing. As I talked about uh, in my opening uh, statement, opening remarks, uh, families are coming out of pocket with a number of expenses that are related to a lot of care provided um, in community. So they're covering for medications, uh, they're paying for home health, um, they're covering uh, co-pays and other expenses. Um, they're covering incontinent supplies. Um, and all of those things are coming out of pocket. Uh, while some caregivers are, are able to cover those, many of them are doing it really at uh, the expense of not being able to care for themselves either now um, or in the future. And so it really is important as we, I really appreciate this question. There's oftentimes this assumption that the family member just by virtue of being a family member or friend, that it is their responsibility to do these things. And while many family caregivers 
um, do feel that way and, and are able to do it, it's important for them to know it's okay to ask for help and to get an understanding of what should be expected um, and what is not. And we see all too often that family caregivers, particularly in community, are left a little stumped as to where they can receive uh, that additional support and help. Um, AARP uh, on our website and our state offices very much engage at the community level um, with the AAAs and other organizations to try to get that information out. But you touch on a very important point, the need for education and tools and resources for family caregivers because they just assume that they have to take on all of these things. Yeah, I think that's, Rita, I think that's really right. And I, uh, one of the other issues um, I think that is really important is how confusing it is for family members and for residents regarding payment. Um, most, most nursing homes residents um, come to, uh, to nursing homes from on Medicare. And uh, uh, as um, we were talking earlier, as um, Carol mentioned earlier, they come in on Medicare and they're only going to be able to stay for a certain amount of days. And it's rarely, if ever, that Medicare pays for the amount of therapy that a resident actually needs. And they're often issued, they're often ushered out of the facility before they feel like they're ready to go home. Um, and but nevertheless, they're presented with a parade of sort of horribles. You know, either you leave and go home, um, or you're going to be stuck with a bill. And I think this falls off often on the shoulders of family caregivers and families as well, because they think, well, I will have to pay for this. And oftentimes you, you're forced to make these decisions in a matter of hours or uh, 24 to 48 hours. And uh, there's just, it's not explained to them, well, you have appeal rights, um, or if they are, um, it, how, how those appeals go and the assistance that are available for those appeals um, can vary um, for, for residents and families. And then there's Medicaid. Um, and a lot of facilities don't want to take Medicaid residents because they feel that they don't get paid enough to provide care for Medicaid residents. Um, and oftentimes that is a resource to, um, to uh, residents. Um, but instead of um, exploring those issues, sometimes family members will take on the, the financial burden of paying out of pocket when there are other resources that may be available to, to residents to have those stays paid for. So I think more clarity and transparency in, I mean, I've been doing this for um, you know, over 15 years and it's still confusing to me some days how um, long-term care is paid for in nursing homes, um, let alone for people doing it the first time. And I think that lack of transparency often leads to rash, dis, rash and um, hurry decisions that result in poor health outcomes for residents, but also can lead to these bills that Eric and everyone has been talking about uh, because people just don't know what's going on. So I think from the outset, we need better education around financing for long-term care and nursing homes. And uh, a lot of this uh, could even be avoided. Well, I, I would be remiss if I did not um, share that um, both CMS and CFPB have produced a number of resources for the public, including for everything from surviving spouses to older adults. And um, we hope that that provides some unbiased, neutral information about how people can navigate the system. Let me just ask um, maybe Eric or Carol or others, you know, if, if you're a uh, uh, in the third party collections or billing, um, if you're in, in that industry or a vendor, from your perspective, what do you think those vendors should be asking um, nursing homes before going and engaging in collections on their behalf? Because it seems that, you know, Carol, others, there's some a lot of differences between how nursing homes are doing billing and collections, who's farming things out to third parties, um, and, and and what are they doing? So what for for collectors who are looking to make sure they're doing things the right way, what might they ask um, before taking on that kind of work? I'm happy to jump in here. I, I think the first thing 
that's critical is that they need to be sure I'm listening to these horror stories and they horrify me as they horrify all of you. They have to make sure that this is legitimately a debt that needs to be collected. You know, if they if they have any familiarity at all with what the regulations are, many of these should not even be sent to collection in any way, shape or form. They're, they're not the responsibility of somebody's sister who's not involved or there's not the responsibility of someone's granddaughter who has no idea that this is coming. I think that's a really critical thing that they have to be looking at. Um, I would be remiss, and I apologize for taking a soapbox millisecond here, but there's one other issue that I think when we talk about consumers and older adults that has to be brought up, and that is the issue of financial exploitation and elder abuse. We are one of 20 elder abuse shelters across the country. There are three and a half million older adults who are victims of elder abuse in this country every year. And in, I would tell you, if not 100%, 99.99% of the cases, financial exploitation is a piece of this. So as you, Director, are looking at consumer safety and financial safety, looking at financial exploitation, elder abuse, I would urge you is an area that should be on the table as well. Well, there, there's there's no question that it it is, and it and it's part of something we think about, frankly, across the board. A few months ago, we actually finalized a rule regarding impacting financial exploitation of survivors of human trafficking. Our our dedicated office on older Americans has worked on this, and it is something that you know fraud perpetrated against this population is just totally unacceptable. So. Uh, we need to wrap, but I want to give, um, I think it's possible Eric was trying to chime in, but maybe not, but I want to give anyone, Eric or anyone else, the opportunity to to say a, a few final words. Well, thanks for recognizing my effort to, to chime in on that last question. I'll, I'll make it brief. It, I think a simple rule of thumb is that the resident should be responsible and other people shouldn't be responsible. It's, it's very simple. I think in the world that a lot of us operate in, the um, collection agencies, as, as some folks mentioned, aren't trying, aren't aren't screening these cases at all. Right? They're 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 not. They see it as, as they're told that money is owed, and they file it, and it's and it's the same complaint that they served against somebody else. There's zero factual. So, um, so that I think is a simple rule of thumb. The resident should be responsible. Other people should not be. That's the intent of the federal law. Facilities for decades have tried various stratagems to, to get around it by ignoring it, by by claiming that it only applies to Medicaid eligible people, um, and now by trying to drag responsible parties in through other arguments. But 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 that's the that's a very simple rule of thumb that I think could be that would be easy to understand if people wanted to, to do things correctly. And that may be the issue, that they, they need to want to do it correctly or to, to, to have sufficient incentive to be forced to do it correctly. Well, I think this discussion was really useful across the board. One, to illustrate kind of what are some of the issues and, and stories about people who are subjected to collection, even though they might not really be legally responsible. Huge differences that are faced between different types of nursing homes and different types of billing practices, as well as really the ongoing work I think we all have to do to make sure that family members know where to go for help, know where to ask for more information and how to really raise their hand when it feels like think something is going wrong. So I, I know we could go on and on. Um, I really appreciate each and every one of the panelists for joining. Um, it is now time for me to turn it back to Deborah Royster for the public testimony portion. Thanks again. Thank you, Director Chopra for moderating this rich discussion. And thank you to our panelists for sharing 
your expertise and your insights on this important issue that affects so many of us. Um, at this time, uh, will the panelists please turn their videos off and we will hear from the public next. One of the ways that the CFPB gathers information about consumer harms is through public input provided at events such as these. Some of you have signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion. When you hear your name, please unmute yourself and feel free to turn your video on or to leave it off, whichever is your preference. Each person who speaks will uh, have two minutes to do so, and we ask you to limit your remarks to two minutes so that we can hear from as many of you as possible. Our first audience testimony will be from Michael Whitkey. Michael, please unmute your microphone and turn on your camera if you would like, and you have two minutes. I think you might be muted, Michael. I think you're still muted. Why? I'll tell Mike, you what. It looks like, oh, okay. Yeah, it looks like you may be unmuted on the WebEx, but maybe having some, maybe we go ahead, Deborah. We can yes. go to someone else until Michael, we fix that. We, why don't you work on that? We'll go to Mary and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Our next, our witness is Mary McCune. Mary, please unmute your microphone and turn on your camera if you'd like, and you have two minutes to speak. Thanks so much. Um, can you guys hear me? Everything's good? Okay. I work at Manhattan Legal Services, and I just wanted to highlight some of the issues that haven't really been touched on today, though I did, I was very happy to see in some of the materials you released today that they were mentioned. Um, I had a case where a, a younger person in their 50s, uh, early 50s, uh, collapsed, had a brain tumor, was completely incapacitated, could not speak, could not communicate, uh, and had to be admitted um, after acute care into a nursing home for rehab. His spouse, who was actually my client, was limited English proficient and did ask, you know, am I going to have to be responsible for any of this money? And was told no signed off on the documents and then was uh, never got any bills, never knew anything was wrong. He had private insurance that they were, it was pre-authorized. They assumed everything would be paid, uh, but then she was sued afterwards. And um, primarily on the theory that she hadn't cooperated in applying for the Medicaid, she didn't know he needed to, uh, to pay for the stay she thought was covered. Um, because he was younger, he had no, and it was a sudden illness, he had no advanced directives in place. She had no power of attorney. So she was in a situation where she was being sued for not taking actions uh, she could not legally take, uh, exacerbated by the fact that because she was ling limited English proficient, uh, to the extent anything had been interpreted to her, it was generally interpreted incorrectly or uh, incompletely. So she was unaware of, of the responsibilities or the paperwork she had signed. And I, I know we focus a lot on older uh, people who are in this situation. I just wanted to highlight that these issues do uh, affect younger people who have more trouble resolving the cases because they may return to the workforce. And so they're pursued more aggressively and that's it. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mary. Uh, let's try and go back to uh, to Michael. Mr. Wick. Okay, I called in through the phone number. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Wonderful. Sorry about the mistake there. Again, my name is Mike Wicky and with the National Alliance for Caregiving. Thank you for holding this field hearing and the opportunity to provide uh, public comment. Some of the data I'll share today has been shared earlier, but it's important to repeat. Um, as of 2019, over 53 million individuals in the U.S. identify as family caregivers. About 61% of them are women. Most family caregivers are in their late 40s or early 50s, providing an average of 23 hours of care per week, which is the equivalent of a part-time job. Many people are sandwiched between providing care to an older adult or relative with a health condition and typical child care duties. The multi-dimensional impacts of family caregiving, including economic and financial insecurity, unfortunately are not new. The financial impact of family caregiving on women specifically is no different. 
Family caregiving is an inherently gendered role through socialization and cultural norms. And in communities of color, the statistics paint an even more dire situation with gender inequity persisting at the forefront. So without raising the alarm to the reality of the financial burden family caregivers experience through financial strain in the wake of persistent gender wage gap, we pretend this inequity will spontaneously disappear if we downplay or ignore it. The inequitable, inequitable financial impact of family caregiving demands attention and relief is sorely needed. One in five caregivers report high financial strain, and this includes taking on more debt, leaving bills, un, bills unpaid or paid late, late, borrowing from family members or friends, being unable to afford basic expenses, and caregivers who earn less than $50,000 a year experience more financial challenges, with, which disproportionately impact communities of color, younger caregivers, and LGBTQ plus caregivers. So as a result of family caregiving, 28% of family caregivers reported they stopped saving, 22% of caregivers reported using up their personal savings, and 12% reported up using their long-term savings. Although these statistics provide important context to the caregiving experience, given the majority of Americans have less than $400 saved to cover an emergency expense, the state alone supports the fact that large proportion of family caregivers do not have the option to either save or rely on savings. It should also be noted that for those family caregivers aged 50 to 64 who are approaching retirement age, one out of three have already used their savings, potentially jeopardizing their long-term financial security. Additional long-term threats to family caregiver financial security includes taking on more debt. The Michael. ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the impact um, for caregivers within our society and millions of caregivers will uh, face economic security into the future after the pandemic is over. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Next, we will thank you, Michael, very much for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Marcus Williams. Marcus, will you please turn on your camera and uh, your microphone before speaking? And you have two minutes. I want to thank you guys for uh, hosting this today. And it's a very important situation. My grandmother was in the hospital from 2018. She passed in 2020. Uh, she had Medicare, Medicaid. The nursing home was receiving her pension and uh, Social Security check. I was her power of attorney. I'm her grandson. We live in Chicago, Illinois. Never received a bill. I was told that everything would be taken care of by them receiving the funds and getting the retirement and pension, I mean, Social Security and pension check. And then all of a sudden, after she passed, I get a notice saying that they made a uh, miscalculation and started sending me a bill for $10,000. And so I'm currently going through that situation. And, you know, it's a burden. It's a burden. I've been in court now two years as part of the probate. And it's looking like once if they don't win in probate, they're going to come after me about admission papers. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for your testimony. And you can turn off your camera at this time and microphone. Next, we will hear from Barbara Robinson. Barbara? Barbara, are you there? There you are. Yes. Uh -huh. There you are. That, my video doesn't want to start. There it we is. We see you and we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, in my case, uh, the bill that I received was not for a family member. It was for a friend of my mother's after my lifelong friend. And after my mom passed away, I started spending time with this woman and helping her with doctor's appointments and that kind of thing. And she eventually asked me if I would be her power of attorney and her healthcare proxy. 
shouldn't have anyone else in the area to do it. And, and I agreed. And she lived on social security, but she did have a small bit of money in a money market account from years before when she had sold her house. So she fought very hard to stay in her apartment. She was in assisted living and in and out of the hospital a lot, um, but she had good insurance. Finally, all of the money was gone. The money market account was gone. It had all gone to home care workers and, and uh, she was hospitalized for the final time and the, she couldn't go back home. Uh, she had to be moved to a facility and she was moved to the Monroe County uh, nursing home in Rochester. And I provided the Medicaid liaison there, Medicare, Medicaid liaison there with all of her paperwork. It was reams. If you've ever had to apply for Medicaid, they go back. I needed to know about her parents and her husband who was deceased. And, and I had all of her checking account statements, money market accounts. It was very obvious when all of that documentation was received, the only money Ms. Patterson had was her social security check. So she was moved over to the nursing home and the day that she was admitted, I met with a social worker and they presented the admission papers. And when it came to the part, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but when it came to the admissions part that financial part they wanted me to sign, I said, I can't sign that. I'm not even family and, and there is no money and I can't pay it. I'm on social security. I was in my late seventies at the time. And I was assured that what I was signing was agreeing to not prevent the nursing home from, from getting her, her money, from getting her estate. And I said, well, certainly I wouldn't do anything to, to do that. And I asked before I left the office, should I collect her social security check and bring it to you down to the business office? And she said, she'll never get another social security check. They'll come directly here. And I said, okay, fine. And during the time that I was in and out of the facility visiting, no one ever said a thing about the bill isn't being paid. I assumed everything was fine. And two years after she passed away, well, not that long after she passed away, I got a bill made out to the estate of Janet Patterson and there was no estate and I kind of ignored it. I went, they know, she, they know there isn't an estate and I don't know why she would owe money anyway. It was for $21,000. So two years after her death, Monroe County sued me for the $21,000. And I think on the premise that I, I probably had misappropriated or I'm not really sure what, what they thought. Um, I didn't have money for an attorney and thankfully, oh my God, God bless them. Western uh, New York law interceded and uh, Anna Anderson helped me. Um, the case was finally dismissed in court, but not not easily. It was a long a long battle, and in fact, the attorneys notified Anna that they planned to appeal it, but the pandemic hit, courts closed down, and their time to appeal ran out. Or I think they would have tried to get it again. Number one, she didn't have any money. Number two, if she had had money, the day she died, the night that I went down there, my power of attorney had ended. I couldn't, if she had any money, I couldn't have gone anywhere near it. And in fact, I went to the bank to talk to the branch manager to see if I could get some indication if, if there was money. And he said, you know, I can't tell you that. I, I can, I simply can't tell you that. So, um, I, I was very fortunate to to get help from legal assistance because I certainly I couldn't have hired a lawyer. Barbara, I, I hate to interrupt. Um, your story is compelling. 
um, we do need to move on to our next witness. So would you please wrap up when you in a few minutes? I have wrapped up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for okay. sharing for sharing your story and for being a witness today. We really appreciate you oh. and and value You're your welcome. Com comments you have provided. You're welcome. Great. You, you may turn off your camera and turn off your microphone. And next, we will hear from Chris Ferris. Chris, are you there? I am here. Great. Get this going? Hello. Please proceed. I want to thank both of you, Director Chopra and Director Royster, for this opportunity. I want to thank Anna for everything she's done for me because I don't know where I'd be otherwise. Um, the process that I went through is very much the horrors that Mira and Eric and Sam and Anna and Emma brought to you. Much of that was part of my experience. Um, and a lot of the surprise you get when, when you find out you're being sued uh, and lawyers are involved because my mother didn't pay her bill even after she left the facility and I never was power of attorney were all of the experiences I had. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. You've heard this numerous times. What I want to focus on is what the long-term effect and the continuing effect is then not only on myself, but on my family and the horror that it has created. And I have no other word for it. Um, my uncle was power of attorney. And as you can imagine, a lawsuit and the mess that has gone on and, and all that involved has caused schism and problems in the family that are at some levels irreversible. Um, I haven't spoken to my mother or my uncle in over a year and a half on the advice not only of my lawyer, but of my counselor and of very close advisor friends who understand some of these laws and have looked into things for me. And it was best during this process not to, to have those doors open because I was not on the same side. I I don't agree with how they handled it either. It should have been handled and someone should have sat down and dealt with this. The nursing home screwed up Medicaid. They screwed up many things. And then they came after my mother and they came after me, even though I wasn't involved and never had access to her money. Um, the stress and the fear and the sleepless nights I went through being an HIV positive individual has actually caused problems with my health and I'm now on medications I might not be on because it impacted, because stress cells does that to you and they don't seem to care. Um, the fear of wondering if what income I have and my particular circumstance would be impacted, I can't explain to you the fear that's involved, especially the 50 year old who at this point, I, there are limits because of the aid I get and how much I can make. I just can't make limitless money to pay someone for something that's not my debt. And as someone who was abused, and at one point someone who was raped in the past, to be victimized knowingly by lawyers and their, their client to get money from me that I do not owe after I simply signed her and being told I was responsible for doing that, to get help from my mother after spending three years trying to keep her obvious and living with her and assisting her is criminal as far as I'm concerned. And as I've been told, I have no recourse for damages against them because when they finally figured out and were told by Anna that I didn't have power of attorney and could never have accessed her funds, they backtrotted out immediately knowing they were on, on, on dirty ground. So the, the hell that they put me through, I will never see justice for. And I know I'm not the only person to, I'm sorry, this has been done too, but it's wrong. I implore you and the people working with you to do something to stop them, to get justice for the people who have been victimized by them, and to get, keep them from doing it to more people. This is wrong. Mr. Ferris, thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier. We will be following up with you afterwards. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. You can turn off your camera and your microphone now, and we will now hear from Marissa Dukowski. Marissa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, this is really powerful. Um, thank you so much for having me. 
Uh, my name is Marissa Dikowski. I'm a white woman with dark hair, pulled back, glasses, and a patterned shirt. Uh, I'm a disabled activist and attorney at SEDEC DC, a nonprofit with the mission of safeguarding the financial health and legal rights of DC residents with lower incomes uh, facing debt-related legal crises. I lead the Disabilities Community Project at SEDEC DC, where we also have a project focused on medical debt. Uh, we provide this testimony based on our experiences helping clients with debt from nursing facilities and observations in the community that we serve. And I'm really pleased to see that much of this was discussed and included today um, and in the materials that were re released today. So thank you so much for that. Um, one of our clients who was a patient at a nursing facility uh, needed to remain for longer while she rehabilitated. Uh, and after her Medicare ran out, she was sued over the remainder of the bill, which was almost $20,000. Uh, the nursing facility did not help her to apply for Medicaid, uh, another very common thread from today, or guide her through that process. Uh, in other situations in DC, nursing facilities have pursued family members for debts owed based on care to loved ones, another common thread. In 2020, the DC Office of the Attorney General entered into an agreement with several DC nursing facilities to stop deceptive billing practices, including requiring family members to sign admission agreements that identified them as a responsible party. Um, another thing that was in the materials that were released today, so thank you again. Uh, we remain wary of nursing facilities requiring family members to sign any agreements um, even if family members note that they're only signing in their capacity as an agent for a resident, um, just due to the possibility that a nursing facility will still inappropriately sue to collect those funds. Uh, stories like these are very common, particularly given Medicare's lack of coverage for long-term care in nursing facilities um, and uh, lack of follow-up um, with trying to pursue Medicaid. We applaud the CFPB for engaging on these issues, and we look forward to working together to stop these deceptive and unfair, unfair practices. Thank you so much. And thank you, Marissa, for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Jeffrey Nazonski. Jeffrey, are you there? Yes, I am. There you are. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Nizanski. I'm an attorney at Legal Assistance of Western New York in Rochester. I have a case that demonstrates common but legally dubious nursing home debt collection practices. My client and his wife were sued for her nursing home bill. Even though my client questioned the bill many times, no one explained to, his, to him that his wife could qualify for Medicaid to pay for it. Because he could not afford to pay her ongoing bill, he took her home against medical advice where she had a horrific fall and wound up in a hospital. Last October, our client received a collection letter from a law firm stating that his wife owed over $15,000. He disputed the debt in writing to the law firm and by phone several times. Nevertheless, he was sued for his wife's debt on an account stated theory that claimed that he somehow had accepted financial responsibility. Importantly, an account stated cause of action can only be, be maintained where there has been no objection made to a bill within a reasonable time. In our case, however, many objections were made and the law firm documented the dispute of this debt in its letter to our client. The nursing home also used in its lawsuit the doctrine of necessaries theory that has been mentioned earlier today that spouses are liable for each other's debts. However, the lawsuit lacked the bare minimum elements needed to establish such a claim, such as one, there's no assertion that the primary debtor was unable to satisfy the debt out of her own resources. Secondly, there was no assertion that services were furnished on the non-debtor spouse's credit. And third, there was no assertion that the non-debtor spouse had the ability to satisfy the debt. Because the nursing home re reform law prohibits facilities from requiring or requesting financial guarantees from third parties as a condition of admission, the admission agreement could not require our client to guarantee payment of the bill. Thus, the nursing home's attorneys knew or should have known that the lawsuit against their client was not legally sufficient as they had no legal basis for either a doctrine of necessaries or an account stated claim. Thank you to the CFB, CFPB for your attention to this important issue. 
I suspect we, we have not seen the last of these lawsuits, so whatever assistance you can provide, regulatory or otherwise, will be most welcome. Thank you again. And thank you very much, Jeffrey, for your testimony today. Our final witness for today is David Bipolko. David, are you there? And yes, so I'm here. Great, you can turn on your camera if you'd like, and please proceed. Yes. I want to thank the director and the panelists for an excellent program. It was very, very informative and it's going to help a lot of people. I think the best thing for me to do would just be to speak in my uh, a new client's words of what happened to him and his family. My mother was in a nursing home in New Jersey with a Medicaid pending application. I provided the information, but I was told I needed to cash out her life insurance policy which was like a burial policy and to sell the burial plot, which his father is buried at. Once I informed them, I wanted my mother to be buried with my father. And there was an, uh, uh, and there was another option. Uh, she, he want, and, and there was another option. They denied the Medicaid application. I asked, at that moment for my mom to be released from the facility. Once my mom was released, I applied for Medicaid at another nursing home uh, facility in PA and let them know about the same issue. They informed me that I could turn over the life insurance policy to the funeral home for her final arrangements and that would satisfy it. I did what they said, provided the documentation to Medicaid, and my mother was approved and has currently been at that facility since 2018. The nursing home is in New Jersey is now garnishing this client. Uh, this has impacted his family financially. Um, my client is having trouble paying, you know, his own family's expenses. Uh, these practices. Uh, I believe a lot of it has to do with nursing homes not having processes and procedures, knowing what to do. I mean, how can one nursing home know what to do and a simple fix, and then another nursing home who didn't want to take the time, and, and that's come out several times today, um, as far as, you know, just educating uh, the family members when they're bringing their loved one to a nursing home. And then these bills are enormous. They're in the tens of thousands of dollars, some approaching six figures. Um, something has to be done. I think it would go a long way, not just uh, to educate, you know, federal courts, but the local courts and local judges to let them know that when a case like this comes before them, not to enter a default where the client ends up getting contacted four years later when he goes to use the ATM to or, or, or goes to the grocery store and his card is declined because somebody took all the money out of his account. I, I really appreciate everything that you've done today. It's been an awesome program. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your testimony today. And thank you to all of our public witnesses for your heartfelt, compelling testimony. Thank you again to our panelists and to all of those who are watching today uh, via live stream at consumerfinance.gov. When residents, advocates, or aging services providers believe that a nursing home is violating the Nursing Home Reform Act, they can share this information with their state Department of Health and their state attorney general. They can also submit a complaint to the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov slash complaints. If they believe that a debt collector, such as a company or a law firm acting on behalf of a nursing home may be engaging in unlawful debt collection or credit reporting practices, again, you may also file a complaint with the CFPB at consumerfinance.gov slash complaints. 
And just a reminder that today's event was recorded and it will be posted on the CFPB website in the coming weeks. This concludes the CFPB's field hearing on nursing home debt collection practices today. We thank all of you for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.